We are going to talk about, I'm going to talk about, you're going to ask questions about, how to write scenes in genre fiction. And the reason why you have to write scenes and have to know how to write scenes in genre fiction is because genre fiction is made up of scenes. It's the opposite from narrative fiction, which is where somebody tells you a story. And they tell you. There's a great deal of description, a great deal of explanation, telling you what people are thinking and how they're thinking and how they got to be the way they are. Whereas in genre fiction, mystery, romance, science fiction, westerns, thrillers, fantasy, all of that, you're not telling a story, you're showing a story. And you show it in scenes. Scenes are the actual story elements that make the story. There's one after another and they're connected together and all together they make a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end based around a conflict, which is about as elemental a description of genre fiction as I can give you. So, a story is a way of posing and answering a dramatic question. You know, um, well, we did Dumbo in the first thing. Uh, it, it's will Dumbo come to believe in himself? as a special kind of creature, a flying elephant, a hero? And the answer is yes, he will. And the reason we know the answer to the question is because we see it happen. The narrator doesn't come in and tell us how the story ends. You see the story end. Right? You're shown it. Um, Casablanca. Uh, the question is, will Rick, having been wounded emotionally and become kind of dead, while still alive, will he come back to life when the girl who wounded him comes into his life and needs his help and gives him a chance to be the kind of hero he used to be before he was wounded and ran off to run a gambling den in Casablanca? And the answer is, yes, he will. And the reason we know that is because we see it happen. There comes a time when he's either going to take the papers and get on the plane, go away with the girl, or he's going to give her the papers to take her husband. And we see that happened, and that's the answer to the big question. That's what the story's about. Now, every scene is a kind of miniature in which you ask and answer a dramatic question. And the answer is going to be either yes, no, or not yet. Because if could be if it was just yes or no, that'd be the end of the story. But not yet means you go on to the next scene. So same example I gave last time. You have a scene in a mystery in which the detective goes into the warehouse at midnight. Because he's got a tip that the evidence he needs for the case is there. So the question being asked in this scene is, will he find the evidence in the warehouse? simple as that. It's not like a grand dramatic question. It's one little question that's part of a series of questions that together make up a story. So he goes into the warehouse and instead of the evidence he finds two goons waiting for him because it's a setup. So the answer in that case is no or maybe not yet because instead of killing him and ending the story they drag him off to see Mr. Big downtown. All right? So scene is has a beginning, a middle, and an end. The beginning is where the detective advances into the scene, moves forward into the, the situation. The middle is when he meets the conflict of the two goons who are there. And the ending is when they haul him off to see Mr. Big. So it's a, a not yet answer to the question. And it leads you to the next scene. And that's important because scenes in stories interconnect one to the other. One thing leads to another. It's not just a series of disconnected, uh, unrelated episodes. Yes? So what about when you do actually jump to another, maybe set of characters or, or whatever, like I'm just wondering about that connection. You know what well, I mean? Okay, the scene that follows the detective getting 
banged on the head and thrown into the car and we're off to see Mr. Big. Right. That doesn't have to be the Mr. Big scene. We could cut to another part of the forest where his, his assistant parallel. is doing something. Yeah, uh, all of which is still moving the story forward. Okay, okay. Or maybe the bad guy is doing something. You know, and we see that happen if we're seeing the bad guy instead of the bad guy being hidden behind the mystery. Um, okay, so the key things here uh, is that you've got the beginning, the middle, and the end. That's the shape of a scene. And you've got the question and you've got the conflict because that's how you make stories work is by putting characters into conflicts and showing what happens. Okay? I mean, write this on the board because I want everybody to always think about this when you're writing stories. This is the indispensable tool of writing genre fiction. Because genre fiction is about conflict. Okay? So, now we know what a scene is, actually. Um, the question is, what does it do? Why do you have it in your story? Right? There's two things that a scene can do. It must do one or the other, and ideally it does both. And one is, I'm going to start writing things down so we actually have them here. One is, it moves the plot. Something happens that leads on to something happening. Okay? And the second is it develops character. A great deal of story making is developing a character because normally in a story, uh, unless it's a James Bond type, exception to the rule. You've got a character at the beginning of the story who enters into the conflict that is the story. And when the character enters into it at the beginning, you know, Dumbo, when he first wakes up in the tree and doesn't know that he can fly, that character is not ready to do the thing that he's going to need to do at the end to make the whole thing work. As the story progresses, scene by scene, you're going to be developing the character. And when I say developing the character, what I mean is the character is going to undergo trials, tribulations, ordeals, journeys, struggles, all to do with this, all of which will grow the character to the point where he or she or it <coughs> will make the big choice at the end that propels the ending of the story. So, there is a third thing, I have to say this, a third thing that a scene can do, and I'm going to put it down here because it does exist, that's a D, and that is to create mood. And the example I like to give is, for those who've read it, The Grapes of Wrath, John Steinbeck. There's a scene early on in the book of a tortoise crossing a road in Dust Bowl, Oklahoma. The tortoise is not a character in the story. The tortoise never appears in the story again. Right? This is an entirely symbolic representation of what the story is about, and it establishes the mood of this hard shell, slow moving creature slowly going forward. And of course, you do worry whether the bus is going to run over when the bus comes and Tom Jode, I think, gets off it. Um, anyway, it's a brilliant little scene. And all it does is set the mood and work a kind of symbolism for what the story is about. And I'm telling you this so that I can now say, don't do that. This is perfectly good enough for genre fiction. If it does one or two, or ideally both of these things, you have a successful scene. I wouldn't advise you to try and create mood, unless you are John Steinbeck, or you know, about the same level, or almost to the same level. So that's left for literature, basically. Oh, well, you can do it in genre fiction too. I'm just saying you should. Right. Okay. Because 
editors are going to say, it's a nice piece of writing, but it uh, doesn't really have anything to do with the story, does it? I think that's what Faulkner was talking about when he said, uh, you must kill your darlings. Mm. That is, the pieces that you really like that you oh, I wrote that really well. <laughs> that's the bit you got to cut out, because it's got nothing to do with this. But Faulkner may have meant something else. He was a genius. I'm not. I don't know. Um, so, I can go either one of two directions here. I always wonder which one to go for. Um, okay. Every story, you remember when we talked about story structure, every story has the thing that happens that kicks it off. Dumbo wakes up in the tree, or Luke Skywalker gets the hologram from the princess saying, help me, I'm a princess, I need help. You know, what's he going to do? He's a hero. Um, or uh, Casablanca, this woman walks into the gin joint. Of all the gin joints in the world, that's the one she walks into is his. And off goes the story for Rick. That's the point at which everything starts to change for him. Until then, he's in a situation, uh, and he's maybe not happy in the situation, but it's his normal situation, and then in she comes and it changes. You have the same thing in microcosm with the scene. There is something that happens that begins the action of the scene. Right, so there's an, what they call an initiating incident. Uh, in the case of the one I made up, uh, the detective, it's when he got the tip that there was evidence in the, uh, the warehouse at midnight, right? And that would have happened in a previous scene. And very often, in fact more often than the rare case where it doesn't, the initiating incident for a, the next scene is at the end of the, the one you're writing now. This is what links them together. Okay. So something happens, makes the scene start, the characters struggle against the conflict, whatever it is, the opposition, they get to a resolution of that scene, yes, no, or not yet. And that yes, no, or not yet will be the initiating incident for the next scene. I think it can be, be summed up with act, react, act, react, yeah. all the way through. One thing is connected to another. It's all linked together. And there's always a reaction after the action. Yes, because the stories are about moving in forward all the time. You know, every character in a story and every character, therefore, in a scene, even minor characters, even guys who are just a doorman, right? In, in this, and that's, you've got two lines in the story, and that's it. But every character has an agenda and is pushing and following it. And where those agendas clash is where you get stores. So you've got the guy who comes to the fancy apartment house and wants to see the millionaire on the top floor, and the doorman's not going to let him in, and that's a little conflict. And the reason the doorman's doing that is because the doorman doesn't let guys like him in unless he's got uh, an invite. So uh, every scene has an initiating incident which leads to a conflict of some kind. Now the conflict can just be two people arguing in a bar, or it can be two people slugging it out in an alley, or it can be 50 people on each side shooting at each other with automatic weapons and throwing hand grenades. And the way that conflict resolves, basically yes, no, or maybe, is how the scene ends and kicks you on to the next scene in the sequence. Um, I was asked last time, how long is a scene? Which is a good question because the answer is as long as it has to be to have the initiating incident, the conflict, and the resolution. So some scenes can be six paragraphs long, and some can be a chapter and a half. Right? It's not, 
the, the word scene as we're using it here is not the same as a scene in a play, which is a fixed place in which action takes place. A scene in a novel can happen over several different locations. And it continues to run as long as the question hasn't been resolved. You could even break in the middle of it and have another scene set somewhere else, which might work. Certainly, you would do that in the case of a flashback. Right? So you've got the detective in the, uh, he's, he's gone into the warehouse, he's looked around, he's sneaking, he hears the creak of uh, big shoes off in the darkness. Stop there, break. Go into a flashback, assuming this is germane to what the story you're telling. Uh, you go back two years, something happened, this, that, and the other. You end that scene, or you may need to continue with the flashback later. It gets really complicated, and that's the way it could be. But then you go back to the scene in the warehouse when the two guys come out of the darkness with baseball bats. So you've broken the scene in the middle and to put something in there which is relevant and explicatory or whatever to the story. The scene, though, would not be over until the question is answered. Okay? Any questions on that? Because that's... No? Okay. All right. Let's talk about mechanics. Um, first of all, we've got show, don't tell, which mystifies some people, but it's really quite simple. Um, writing scenes is an artificial way of storytelling. It's not the natural way of storytelling. <clears throat> the natural way of storytelling is what you would do if somebody said, uh, you know, what happened to you on your vacation last year? And you say, well, we went to Mexico, and it was really hot, and we had some really hot food, and we got the tummy tickle. But then it was okay, and we went out on the beach, and we met these, these people from somewhere, and they were amazing, and then we had dinner with them, and we talked about it. You know, that's how you tell a story, right? Narrative is what that is. You're telling something. But if we're doing a scene based on your vacation in Mexico, you start off, uh, you know, it was sweltering hot under the palms, and even hotter out on beach where the sand took the sun and threw it back in your face until you could feel it burn just the moment you stepped out onto it. But still we didn't care because we were there for the sun and we were there for the palms and so on. Right? So Madge and I, we walked down the beach together, talking about things the way they used to be, hoping they could be that way again. I'm making this up as I go, so if it's corny. Uh, we saw another couple further down the beach and they seemed to be I don't know, they thought they were arguing, so we go near them and stay away from them. This is, you're doing a scene. Moment by moment, what's happening? You didn't summarize it by saying, we went there, we met this couple, and, which is narrative. But you're doing it moment by moment as it happens. Um, I have no idea what would happen in that scene because I'm making it up as I go. It's pure and conscious. Uh, maybe it would turn out to be those people on the beach. They were uh, ex-spies or something, and they were arguing with each other about whether they should kill the guy in the cabin next door. And you came up on them, and they broke off the conversation, smiled at you in a practiced way, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and then the mystery begins. I presume that would be a mystery story. But it would be a story. It wouldn't be like real life. It would be a constructed thing with different <coughs> scenes that all went somewhere and answered some dramatic question. So, show don't tell means that you have moment by moment action. You show the action. You don't summarize it. You show especially key details of what's happening, who's doing it, what they're saying while they're doing it, and even sometimes what the character may be thinking, especially the point of view character. So 
So you have immediacy and you have continuity. You have step by step. That a scene has a time to it, has a linear time to it. It doesn't just happen in the the never never dream time, the way things do when you say, well, yeah, we went on vacation and we met these people. It has a, a clock to it. The clock starts to tick when the, the scene begins and it ends, stops ticking when the, the scene resolves. So I'm going to do you this thing. I'm going to read you uh, some narrative, and then I read you a scene covering the same stuff. You weren't here for this before, were you? This will be all new to you. All right, narrative. <laughs> And that there's nothing wrong with this, uh, well, I say I wrote it, there's nothing wrong with this writing as narrative. It's just not seen. On a stormy evening, Harry went to George's place. He broke in through the kitchen door at the back of the house. The place was dark, silent, and empty. But Harry methodically checked the rooms, even the closets, before settling into an overstuffed armchair in the living room. He got out his silence pistol and waited patiently until George came home. When George caught sight of Harry and the gun, he was frightened. He wanted to make some kind of deal, but that wasn't what Harry was there for. George took two shots and died. The wonderful thing about narrative is it's compressed and simple. And, you, know, you just get the information told to you. Now here's what it looks like when you see it being shown to you. The rain had been coming in wind-borne gusts all evening, and chill droplets were finding their way into the upturned collar of Harry's raincoat as he made his way down the walkway to the back of George's two-story clapboard house. He stopped at the kitchen door, put his ear to its glass panel, and listened. Nothing. Harry's gloved hand brought a small jimmy from the deep front pocket of the coat. He slipped its chisel-shaped end into the gap between the lock and the jam. He waited until a car came by on the street out front, and when the swish of its tires was loudest, he leaned hard on the pry. With a groan and a crack, the door popped open. Harry stepped inside and pulled it closed behind him. He slipped the jimmy back into his pocket and stood in the darkened kitchen. The remains of a Chinese takeout dinner were in the sink and on the counter, the stale odor filling the room. Harry listened. Again, nothing. He went through into the hall, moving silently, and checked the living room and the dining room that George was using to store a dozen or so cardboard boxes. Then he climbed the stairs, placing his feet on the outside of each riser so the old boards wouldn't creak. Upstairs were two bedrooms and a bathroom, both empty, the smell of dust thick in the air. Harry didn't expect to find anyone, but he checked the closets, even looked under the beds. Back downstairs in the unlit living room, he had a choice of two overstuffed armchairs. He chose the one with a flower pattern and carried it to the center of the faded rug, positioning it so that it faced the archway that connected to the hallway that ran from the front door to the kitchen. Harry settled into the chair, crossed his left leg over his right knee, and drew the pistol from the shoulder holster and the silencer from the inside breast pocket of his suit jacket. He carefully screwed the suppressor's threaded end into the muzzle, then flipped open the cylinder and checked the loads. He checked them before coming out tonight, but it never hurt to be sure. He wriggled his shoulders against the back of the chair, getting comfortable, then laid the barrel of the gun across his upturned leg. He waited, listening to the sounds of cars going by. <coughs> After maybe half an hour, he heard one slowing, then the creak of worn brakes and the engine dying. The door slammed, and moments later, Harry heard the click of a key sliding into the front door's lock. George came in, flicked on the light that lit up the hallway. The top of the archway cut off some of the spill of light into the living room so that it fell only onto Harry's leg and the pistol barrel with its silencer, leaving the rest of him in shadow. George set a paper bag on the small table next to the hall closet. He took out his hat and shook the water from it, then put it beside the bag. He opened the closet door and began to pull off his car coat, turning half toward Harry's eliminated leg and gun. Harry saw the man freeze, the coat still half off. George turned toward the archway, slowly, carefully, the color draining from his cheeks, his eyes so wide Harry could see white all around the iris. The bump in the front of his throat went up and down, and when Harry raised the pistol, George said, Listen, can we talk about this, can't we? Listen, we can talk about this, can't we? 
The first shot took him in the throat, right where Harry placed it. George's head slumped forward while the rest of him flew back into the open closet. He was sliding down the closet's back wall, empty hangers rattling and falling from the wooden bar, when Harry's second round drilled through his forehead and blew out the back of his skull. Harry stood up, already spinning the silencer free of the pistol. He reholstered the weapon and checked the body because that's the way he had been taught. Then he stood looking down at the dead man. They always thought there was something to talk about, yet Harry never had anything to say. Now, a lot more detail than this. Scenes are about detail, right? Narrative, summarizing, you're telling people stuff. You don't need the detail. The detail in scenes is what makes it come alive, right? So when he goes into the, you don't say he broke into the, the back door. You show him, take the jimmy out of his pocket, stick it in the door, wait till there's a noise, and then he's in, right? He gets into the house, it's dark, it's silent, it stinks of old Chinese food. Details like that. So the reader, following this character's point of view, and this is Harry's point of view of the killer, as he's going through this scene, they're inside him. Right? They've got his sensorium is what they're using to apprehend the scene. This is important. Um, and you'll see, as I read it, it had a definite timeline. Things were happening in sequence and in order. He got in. He checked the downstairs rooms, he went upstairs, he looked in the closets, he even looked under the beds, came downstairs, positioned a chair, sat, took out the gun, got it ready, waited. All of those things happened in order. And the reader is following along with that. The reader's inside the story now, inside Harry, doing this thing. Okay. And that brings me one of the most important things you're going to have to learn to do in genre fiction and in writing scenes, and that is master point of view. You've got a choice in writing genre fiction, basically. There are different kinds of point of view that you can use. There is first person. That's when the entire story is told from the point of view of the narrator. The narrator is the point of view character. Doesn't mean the narrator is the hero, right? Who's the point of view character telling the, showing, narrating the Sherlock Holmes stories? Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson, who is not the hero of the story, but he is the point of view character. So everything is apprehended for the reader from Watson's point of view, which was a brilliant thing for, uh, for uh, Colin Doyle to do because Watson is very often wrong, in, and uh, that makes Holmes even more right. And Watson doesn't know what's going on, the same as the reader, but he's carrying it along. So first person is perfectly legitimate uh, way to be doing genre fiction. And I've done it myself. I've written a number of novels and quite a few stories in the first person. And you're welcome to do that if you want to do it. There are certain limitations to having first person point of view, which have to do the with the mechanics of bringing information into the story. Because any information that's in the story, this character has to come across. So you're always having characters having to see a headline, overhearing a conversation, bumping into somebody by coincidence, seeing somebody they shouldn't have seen, whatever, um, hearing something on the radio as they're driving. That's how the information is brought to them. Normally, most uh, genre fiction is told in the third person which is he, she, did this. What I gave you here is told in the third person. Is there anybody who doesn't have a difference between first and third person? You could go over it. Well, 
First person is I. I tell the story. I am the hero. So as with the you know the scene in Mexico, it's Madge and I were down on the beach, and we were doing this and we were doing that, and I saw this and I saw that. Okay. In the third person, uh, it would be Matt and Madge. So Matt and Madge were down on the beach, and he saw this and she said that. Right. There is second person. And I'm just going to say it long enough to dismiss it. That's where the story is you. You open the door. You walk into the room. You smell something odd. You look around. You. That's what the reader is getting, you. Right? <coughs> and it's done sometimes as a trick in a short story where it turns out you are the murderer. Right? Surprise at the end. Um, or you are the alien from another world. But mostly it's used when you get to the end of the segment and it says, go to either page 38 or page 45, because it's a choose your own adventure thing. So that's, you don't need to know about second person. But third person, he, she, comes in two kinds. Third person omniscient is when you, the person writing the story, are essentially the one with the point of view. And you see everything all the time, and you show it as it happens. And essentially it's as if you've got a, a stage in front of you with characters on it, and you are telling what they're doing to the reader from outside the characters. You're looking over their shoulders, you're seeing them do this, you're seeing them do that. You're not narrating it in the sense that you're simply telling what happened. You're showing what happened, but you're showing it from God's point of view, looking down on everything, knowing everything, and letting the reader in moment by moment, detail by detail as to what's happening. Most people, when they start to write genre fiction, if they're not writing in the first person, they're writing in third person omniscient. And it's not good. It's not good because it doesn't have the impact and the immediacy of writing in first person or in third person limited. Now what I mean by limited is the point of view in a scene can be different points of view as you go through the stories in different scenes. Right? But in a scene, the point of view is limited to one character. One character in that scene is the point of view character. Now, in this one of Harry and George, who's the point of view character? Harry? Yeah, the killer. Now, when George comes in, George is surprised and frightened, right? How do we know that? We know that because Harry saw the man freeze. Harry saw the man freeze. Not we saw the man freeze. So it wasn't the man froze. It was Harry saw the man froze. We were inside Harry for this scene. We were experiencing what was happening through Harry's senses. Harry smelled the Chinese food. Is that also the same, and sometimes call that third person close? I've never heard that, but it could oh. be. But what I've always heard is third person limited, okay. which means, and the actual definition is, in any scene, there is one person who is the point of view character. It doesn't have to be the same person in every scene, but it is one person per scene. Now. In literary fiction and in uh, well, British uh, genre fiction. In fact, I'm reading the John Cleary book right now, who's Australian. Uh, he does this. 
And in a matter of a paragraph, and I just came across an example, I was reading it earlier today, he had four or five different characters marching along a jungle trail in World War II in the Pacific. And sentence after sentence would change point of view. We were in this character's head, and then that character's head, and then so on. And in North American genre fiction, that is verboten. You cannot do that. It's called this. And it's not allowed. And it's strictly a convention of how it's done. But if you write and do head hopping in the scene of a genre fiction novel or story that you're trying to sell to a North American publisher, they will go, no. And if you do it a lot, they that's enough of a, a flaw for them to say no. Right? What they really want to see, let me finish this, what they really want to see you do, if you're not writing in the first person, and mostly they don't want first person in genre fiction, unless you're a really good writer, they, they prefer, and the readership prefers, even though it doesn't know it, the readership prefers third person limited point of view. And this is a skill you have to master. And it takes some effort because it's unnatural. It's not the way we normally tell stories. But once you master the techniques, and mostly it's getting the idea right into your head that this is the way you're supposed to be doing it, third person limited. So instead of how things are, you reveal how things are to the character. A classic uh, uh, illustration, example, and I, I'll recommend an exercise after. You've got a character who's in absolute pitch blackness, a living room, say, that's all. And he's making his way across it, and he bangs his shin on a coffee table. Okay? If you're in the omniscient mode, you say, Joe stumbled through the darkness and barked his shin on a coffee table. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you, you describe what happened. He stumbled through the darkness. But suppose you're Joe, and you don't know there's a coffee table two feet in front of you. What do you get? You go forward, and you get a pain in the shin. Ow! And then you reach and feel, and it's a coffee table. It's a subtle difference, but it's a huge one at the same time. Oh, you don't know it's a coffee table. He doesn't know it's a coffee table. He just knows he's got a yeah, pain. Right. Mm -hmm. First comes the sense information, then the understanding of what it is. Uh, it's the same thing. Um, the guy is feeling his way through the darkness in a basement, and there's a hole. And he puts his foot out, and there's no floor. Now, he doesn't know if it's a hole that big, and he doesn't know if it's two feet deep or a hundred feet deep. He just knows there's a hole and he's got to fall back. And then he can creep forward and drop a little bit of concrete down it, and hear the water splash far below, and then he knows what it was. But if you're describing it as he felt his way through the darkness to the hundred foot deep hole, and almost fell into it, but stepped back just a bit, it's different. It's a different experience for the reader. And this is the, this is the experience people want when they get into genre fiction. They want to be inside the character, experiencing the story through the character's senses. So it's never just cold, right? You don't say it was, well, you can if necessary. I mean, you don't have to describe every frickin' thing. But instead of the room was cold, you have the boot goosebumps on the arms, the hair on the back of the neck. Right? A character is afraid. You don't say he was afraid. You have the taste of fear, that coppery taste in the mouth, and that shiver of adrenaline going through the back muscles. Those sensations do it. That's how you convey it. Yes. So for a beginning author, um, you know, choosing between third person limited and first person, which one would be easier to learn and, and what would be the best way to go? This is for a beginning author, this is the best way to go. Okay. And the reasons for that are, this is more difficult. Okay. And this can get you into all kinds of twists and turns where you're trying to figure out how the hell does he know about it so that he can move forward? You know, how does he find out? Um, 
this, you can chip, switch, switch characters. You can go to a different character. Yes. Right. right. And also, uh, this is what they want more than they want this. They'll take this if it's well done. But this is what, when an editor opens the manuscript and takes a look at it, genre fiction, from somebody who's not been published and they don't know you, if they see on the first page good third person limited writing, that's a hurdle you've gotten over right from the beginning. And that's, that's also always in the past tense, right? In genre fiction, oh yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, that, we haven't talked about that, but uh, I'll talk about that right now, and it's very simple. You have the past tense, you have the present tense. He was, he is. Right? Writing genre fiction, you don't write, he is. Maybe if you're doing a hard-boiled detective story and it's only going to be 5,000 words long, fine. But you don't write a genre fiction novel in the present tense. Just the same as apparently you don't write a narrative literary fiction novel in anything but the present tense. They all seem to be written in the present tense now. That's a mark of writing literary fiction as you write in the present tense. <coughs> Don't ask me why, but it is. It's interesting because I think the Hunger Games was written in the first person present tense. Could well be. So, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't th have thought of that as literature. But maybe it is. <laughs> maybe the person who wrote it thought it was. It, it's, you can get away with it. You have to be I, good. I, I've written stuff, I've written stories in the present tense and sold them to Hitchcock magazine and so on. But this is, just as they're looking for third person limited, they're looking for past tense. Okay. And, and why shock them? Yeah. Because uh, I, I can I, never get through a story that's that. I, I look at a book and if I see present tense, I just. Well, you see, back. you have not drunk the Kool Aid. <laughs> <laughs> um, aside completely uh, on this, I. Uh, I spent some time in a house in a little town uh, in Saskatchewan, and the house used to be the boyhood home of Wallace Stegner, who's a big Western writer. Not a, a writer of Westerns, but a Western American writer, and a friend of Steinbeck and a, of other great American Western tradition writers. Um, so, and this house had been taken over and refurbished by the local arts council, God bless them. Uh, and they let us stay there for a few weeks because I was a writer and I didn't have anywhere to live between houses. Um, but they have writers in residence come in the summer and they also will rent it out to any writer who wants to get away for a while. And I recommend it. It's two fifty a month. Uh, everything there, you know, nice furnished house, you've got a room to work in upstairs, good light, uh, and the utilities all paid, and peace and quiet. I mean, it's a town of maybe 500 people in southern Saskatchewan, an outsider are hills, and it's quiet. So the place is called East End, one word. In Saskatchewan. East End, Saskatchewan. And if you get in touch with their local arts council and say, could I come there and rent that for a few weeks and just get away, uh, they'll probably say, yeah, and, and give you a, a time. There's always people getting it. Anyway, the thing is, present tense, past tense, back to the actual subject. Um, writers who have stayed in that house have left copies of their books. So I took a look at Wallace Stegner's collection. They have one of every of his books in there, because I was interested. Uh, and I noticed, apart from anything else, this is, I then began the survey, uh, all of his books written in the 40s and 50s and so on, written in the past tense. They were literary works of the time. I looked at the ones left behind over the past 20 odd years, however long they've been renting this house out to, to writers by modern literary writers, and with one exception, they were all in the present tense. I took a look at the creative nonfiction contest that CBC had uh, this year, because I thought I might enter it. I looked at the three runners-up and the winner from last year. They're all in the present tense. Yeah. It's become, um, I don't know, some sort of badge that you wear if you want to be considered a literary writer, you write in the present tense. Maybe because it's more difficult to, to do it well. I don't know. I, I think it might just be that... Uh, it's different. No, it's not different anymore. <laughs> it's it's yeah, become right. what you do. It's like if you want to go to Eaton, you better have a certain accent. 
you get how you, have, you get the smell of the nest on you. You're one of us. That's what I figure. Um, so anyway, if you're going to write genre fiction, limited third person past tense, that will do. Um, Okay. Um, let's go back again to one person per scene. Sometimes you want to have the same action seen from two different points of view, right? Like there are two characters in this thing, and one of them is the point of view character in a scene as this action happens. But then you want to know what the other character's response to that action or participation in it, how they felt about it, thought about it, experienced it. What you have to do, instead of head hopping from scene to scene, you have to have different scenes. Each one has a different point of view character. It could be alternating in tranches like that, or it could be the whole thing, and then the whole thing again from another character's point of view. And in both cases, uh, that key thing, I'll write it down. From the character's own sensorium, which means what the character sees, yes, what the character hears, but most people taking on this business of writing uh, first person or third person limited. Basically, this is what they do. But you've got other senses than seeing and hearing. Mm -hmm. And one of the most important ones if you have basically a movie screen with sight and sound on it, but no smell, right, you're missing probably the most important human sense in terms of emotion. Because this is the oldest one. We could smell stuff, our primitive, you know, multicellular ancestors, long before they could see or hear, they could smell stuff. And if you uh, think about things from your own life, uh, an odor, a particular scent, can call up a memory like that from long ago. Something you haven't smelled, you know. Grandma's rose water perfume. If you smelled that again, Granny would be right beside you if you turned it up. That's how immediate it is. And the same goes very much for touch and taste. Now, there's only so many things you can taste as you go through the world, unless you're very strange. Um, but touch, we're tactile creatures. And people do feel their way through things quite a lot. Uh, and when you're walking down the street, you know, there's not just what you see and hear or even smell, there's the wind blowing through your face, there's the feel of the, the gravel under your feet. There's all the things you have to push through in the world doorways, uh, thickets, crowds of people. Right? If you do all of this, again, this is inside, from inside the character. Not describing from the outside, oh, you know, he felt cold, whatever. Um, touch especially in terms of violence. Uh, if you're doing fighting, struggling, pushing, shoving, how it feels to be hit. Not he was hit, because, oh yeah, okay, he was hit in the head. No. What's it like to get hit in the head? It's like a, a bright light and an incredible pain and a shock, and for a moment you don't know what's happened. And then you're kind of dizzy and you're trying to figure it out. Coming at it from inside the experience, not bang, he got hit on the head. Again, this kind of experience brought to them in detail and that doesn't mean in exhaustive detail, but in key detail. That's what people want when they buy these books and read them. That's, that's what they're paying their whatever for, their $2.99 or their 
$30 whether they're getting a TV book or a hardcover. This is it. Okay. Can I make a suggestion that, that there's a book written about 25 years ago in Germany called Perfume. Oh, you have read it? Perfume. 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 <laughs> and there's yeah. a movie that's been made of it as well. I've heard of it. Yeah. It's a fabulous book, fabulous movie, both. And it has to do with how do you deal with perfume in a movie yeah. and all the smells because the guy who, the main character, just has this enormous capacity to understand smell. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it, it's a very amazingly touch and very smell taste that comes into this and he, he manages to pull it off in the movie if you haven't seen it. It's a fabulous movie mm. and book. Okay. And, um, it, if, Looking at the difference between how the movie handles something and seeing how the book written, how they managed to pull this off is really interesting. Yeah, it would be, because if you, in the book you could really evoke smell, because everybody's got smell and scent memory. In the movie it would be a little more ways. difficult, because yeah. you, all you smell is that theater around you, you know, or your own living room. Yeah. Okay. Um, Last, well, two things to talk about. Um, by the way, there are other senses, you know, than these. I mean, all the kinesthetic senses. Yeah. Balance, for example. Mm. Nausea is another one. But you don't need too much of that. But if you do have it, don't say he felt nauseated. Say a bubble of bile forces its way up. And he's Smell the taste of sulfur filled his, his mouth. And kind of um, give them what they're paying for. Now, I keep saying about writing detail, and I said not exhaustive detail, but the key detail. Right? The thing that works, the thing that matters. Um, let's take a look at Harry and George here. Um, as I was reading you that scene, part, did you have a pretty clear image of what Harry looked like in your mind as he's going through? No. Didn't look like a guy in a raincoat? Yeah. That's, that's what you need. Did you need any more? Yeah. Did he have a long nose or a short nose? Was he bald or did he have a lot of hair on his head? The thing is, it doesn't matter. I, I've written novels in which the central character is not described at all. And it just doesn't matter that he's not described at all. Because he's doing stuff. And the reader is following him doing stuff. And what he looks like is simply not germane. You know, if it's germane that the character is exceptionally handsome, or ugly, or tall, or has a hunchback, then those details are in there. But uh, this is an Elmore Leonard uh, recommendation. Um, don't wear your reader down with descriptions of details that don't have anything to do with what's going on, with, with what the story is. Right? Give them what they need to understand what's happening in the action and for it to have meaning to them. The rest of it, I could have described the suit he was wearing, if he was wearing one, or jeans and a, a sweatshirt, it didn't matter what he was wearing. It was a rainy night, so he had a raincoat on. Okay, and, and the water dripped down in his collar, and that's how we know it was cold and wet. Right? Uh, but the rest of it, no need. And the thing you've got to remember, and it's the most wonderful thing to know when you're a writer, is this, confabulation, that's a you. I'm not a good printer, I'm a writer, not a printer. Um, confabulation is a uh, capacity, an ability of the human mind, and I'm sure other uh, kinds of minds, brains, to see a detail or part of something, and from that confabulate the whole. And I think it was 
evolved in us when we lived in trees and you look through the branches and see a little bit slice of, of something pale and yellow and that was a fruit and you only have to see a little bit to know oh fruit go and get it and eat it or you're in the long grass and you see a tawny shape just about that much of it go by above the grass and that is a lion you don't have to see the whole lion when you see that little bit you know a lion all right we all have this and our readers have this galore because they're normal human beings so you don't have to give a full detailed picture of anything because if you give them enough they'll confabulate the rest what this means is thank god you don't have to slow down your story for all kinds of description of meaningless detail as long as you have the right detail in there the part that has to do with the story the thing going forward you know the pistol the silencer and he carefully screws it on and he checks the, the bullets so you know he's got a gun with bullets and a silencer that's all I didn't tell you what kind of gun it was did I yeah. if you know about guns you know it was probably a revolver because silencers work a lot better on revolvers than they do on automatics but um, so here's the example I always use, I used it last time. I say to you, a ship out on the ocean, and invite you to get a picture in your head of a ship out on the ocean. Everybody got one? A yacht. A yacht, two yachts, that's a coincidence. Must be some sort of Vulcan line in the middle of here. <laughs> A freighter. Freighter. Yeah, square rigger. Off. Very tiny. In yeah. this oh, no, I haven't asked that. Now, how many people had uh, a calm sea? How many had a rough sea? How many people had day? Anybody have night? Ship going towards you? Ship going away? Across my bow. Going <laughs> past. <laughs> left to right? <laughs> right to left? Sinking? Anybody sinking? No. No sinking. Um, I didn't give you any of that. I said a ship out on the ocean, and you made a picture with day and night and a kind of ship and which way it was going, what the sea was like, and you did all of that by confabulation. Because you people, people do that. So this is always with you every time you're writing a scene and you're choosing details to put in the scene. That's always working for you. A hell of a lot of the heavy lifting is being done for you by the reader's mind. Because writing this stuff, writing anything, but writing genre fiction particularly, I think, is a matter of pitching and catching. You pitch and the reader catches. Without both, it doesn't happen. I mean, you put, there's black and white stuff, right? But to get it into your head, you have to hear it and take it in. Now, every one of you will have different pictures of Harry and George. Matt, did you have, as, a, as the writer, an extremely detailed picture of Harry in your mind? No. Always? No. No. No, I focus on what I need. If I have to, I can confabulate one. You know, I could see a Harry and tell you what he looks like, whether he had a mustache or not. But I wouldn't bother, because what's important about Harry is what he does and how he does it. But to keep consistency always, was, wouldn't you have to have a, an image of who he was and what he looked like? And well, how again, he was built? again, remember, I've written entire novels, I just finished one, in which the narrating, it, they're in first person uh, in this case, where there's simply no description at all of the character. You know he's uh, in his 30s, and I guess you could infer from the way people respond to him that he's neither huge nor tiny, mm -hmm. ugly, nor handsome. He's just an ordinary guy. Yeah. And he's not particularly athletic, but he's not crippled. You know, all of that stuff you could infer. And it really doesn't matter, because what he is is an ordinary guy who gets into uh, extraordinary situations, not really of his own choosing, because it's one of those kind of crime stories. 
the amateur sleuth who doesn't really want to be a sleuth, but gets mixed up in something and has to find a way out. But honest to goodness, I, I have uh, written to it with that character now, and I've written others. In fact, basically, I usually don't give much description to my characters. I'll tell you why. Um, apart from anything else, apart from it's not necessary, I read a book years ago by a guy called Scott McCloud, and it was called Understanding Comics. Uh, I think that was the title. Magazine comics? Comics. Comics. Yeah, graphic oh. novel comics. Um, and it was really quite interesting in his take on stories and the depth of his understanding of stories. And one of the things he said that I took to heart, um, he was talking about Tintin uh, and Hervé, the uh, Belgian uh, artist who did these comics back from the 30s, and they're still around, I think. They've made a movie recently. Tintin was pretty good at that. Yeah. Well, if you look closely, you'll notice that the villains are drawn in a more realistic style than the hero. Tintin himself is a more iconic figure in the sense that he's uh, less detailed, more generalized a character than the bad guy and the henchman. And McLeod was saying, and I think he's probably right about this, is that the, the reason that was done was that the fewer uh, striking characteristics, shall we say, of the hero, the easier it was for the reader to invest himself into or herself into that character. Right? The less detail there is. You know, if there's no reason why the hero should be red-haired, you don't make him red-haired. Because that way people don't really relate to red-haired people will not be alienated from it. That they can, in, and remember, you're writing from within the sensorium of a character. The more iconic that character is in terms of physical description and so on, the easier it is for the reader to feel that he or she is in that character. Now, it's a debatable point, but I was persuaded by the guy's argument, and, I, and it certainly doesn't do any harm. You can't do yourself any harm making it easier for your readers to identify with the character if they are going to identify with it. Okay? Um, okay, last thing. And uh, I did the same thing I always did. Um, okay, a movie from 1945 and 1965 even. Uh, typical, you know, Hollywood movie. Scene opens with a, an establishing shot of a city street, and a car comes to the curb in front of a tall building, and a, a character gets out of the car, crosses the sidewalk, goes into the building. Next scene, and this is seen as in movie, not in what I'm talking about. Next shot, shall we say. Character crossing lobby of building to elevator. Next shot, getting out of the elevator on upper floor, walking down the hallway, going into office, with Sam Spade in glass on the office door. Next shot, character sitting at desk saying to Sam Spade, my brother's missing, you've got to find him. All right? Now, in 1940, 1960, 70 even, all of that is standard movie making technique. You're establishing the setting, the character moving through it, and then the initiating thing, the thing that begins the action of the scene is when he says, you gotta find my brother. Everything until then is writing into it. Right? You would not see that in today's movie, in today's movie story making. And you don't see much of it in today's genre writing, story making. Okay? It's called writing your way into the scene. And there's also writing your way out. So these are the things you don't do? That's what I'm going to tell you. Oh, okay. Okay. Today, you start that scene with the character leaning over the desk and saying, my brother's missing, you've got to find him. 
You want to sketch where we are right now. The detective leaned back in his chair and put his feet on his back at the desk and said, why is he missing? You know, that kind of thing. But you get the scene started at the point where the action of the scene begins. And when the action of the scene is over, that is when the question, yes, no, not yet, resolution, right, that answer has been given, that's when the scene ends. And you don't write, he got up and left the room and went downstairs and had a sandwich in the coffee shop. All of that comes out. Now you may very well, especially if you haven't been doing this for donkey's years, you may very well do this, and you may very well do that, and then what I want you to do, though, is when you come to second draft, that's when you say, oh, I'm writing my way in, don't need that, and I'm writing my way out, cut it out. Right? And what you'll find is the pacing of your story will increase very nicely. And you'll also be in tune with modern convention, modern taste, shall we say. Now, there's going to be exceptions. Um, if you're Michael Connolly and you're writing The Lincoln Lawyer, you've got to have a certain amount of driving around in The Lincoln because that's almost a character in the story. But in general terms, know where the action begins in a scene and know where it resolves. And don't do anything before or after that than the absolute minimum necessity to make the scene work. And you'll have tighter, faster, better paced scenes. And that brings me to the end of talking about scenes. Any more questions or discussions or things you've always wanted to know? external problem, but a new internal problem, too. Okay. So, book two. Uh, Dumbo is now a famous flying elephant. And he falls in love with another elephant girl. And they're happy, but then uh, an evil circus owner buys the other elephant girl, takes her off, and abuses her, and makes her pull heavy loads, or whatever it is, I don't know. Uh, and Dumbo has to solve that problem and also maybe uh, you've, got, you've got to create an internal as well as an external problem. But that's his next adventure, is saving the loved one. Yeah. Which was actually the first adventure too, he's saving the loved one at the end. Um, but you'd have to give him an internal problem that uh, made it difficult for him to solve the external problem. Okay. The two have to solve together. But that's not scenes, that, that's story. Yeah. All right. Another thing that uh, seems to be more common in certainly in TV ser series, but I think in books as well, is um, things being sort of multi-threaded, you know, multiple threads. Yes. Which, and so basically, could you consider each thread to be like a separate problem? like? And so it needs to have its questions and answers, and you know what I'm saying. Are you, are you talking like, like a braided have, narrative where you've got three heroines, yeah, uh, three sisters, like and one's gone off to the the big city and become a, an executive, and one stayed home with mom, and the other is kind of sure. Let's say um, that's not a bad example. Okay, and and then mom dies, and they all come home for the funeral, and then they have to find a way to make their lives gel again. Yeah, and they're jealous of each other or angry at each other. You know, why did you leave me home with mom? She was awful. Yeah, so you've got, actually got three stories there, right? Which 
braid right. into one big story. And the resolution at the end is probably going to have to be, well, maybe two happies, one sad could be. But if you can find a way to make it all come out together. All that's inner it. and outer, for yeah. all three of them, yeah. for example. Yeah. Right. And, uh, so what I'm thinking about is as you move from scene to scene and when they're separate. Um, well, you've got Abigail, Betty, and Carol, ABC, right? And you start with Abigail, and she's on her way home from the big city, hasn't been there for years, you know, left it all behind. And she's on the plane, and she's dictating a, a letter on her, you know, phone or whatever. And going through some sort of real inner trouble, which is really a surprise to her, because she wasn't expecting to be like feeling like this. She's just going home for the funeral. And then you get to that point, you stop, and then you go for Betty, right, who is uh, married to the boy next door living down the street, uh, and he's a drunk or, or whatever, a wastrel, and they've got these two kids. And so she's, you know, mom is just down the street, but she hasn't seen her for three years been problems there, but now Mom's dead. And then you get her story begun, and then it's over to Carol, the one who stayed home with Mom, and is bitter and resentful and so on, and you get her whole thing. And then you just go back and forth and okay. push them forward. And of course, as they get together, that's when the plotting gets complicated, right. because what Carol says is what Abigail is responding to now. And, and it's... Uh, it's a trick. It's much trickier than having one hero with a problem to solve, inner and outer, and pushing forward to do that. But uh, it can be a very satisfying kind of novel to read if you like that kind of novel. There's also the idea of plot and then little subplots along the line. Well, yes. Yeah. Uh, now we're talking back to talking story. Um, oh, I see. Okay. You can have. Uh, You've got a main plot, and you can have two subplots as well. And they're not unconnected, shall we say. Because one character in the, like the sub, secondary character in the subplot, shall we say, can be a reflection in some way on the main character's situation. Could be, uh, you know, there but for fortune goes I. Uh, and the main character resolves and overcomes the big problem, and the sub plot character doesn't. And so you actually have a kind of Greek chorus commentary by implication on what the main plot is. You know? uh, so Don Quixote uh, goes off and, and doesn't triumph, but Sancho Panza opens it and in and he's pretty damn happy. You know? and it's been a long time since I read Don Quixote. Um, but that kind of thing. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff you can do in making stories, depending on what the story is you want to make and how you want to make it work. It, it seems the, 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 the current thriller genre has that, just so many things going on, and, you know, chapters are three lines long sometimes, and quite frankly, it seems like so much easier to write than to do uh, all these transitions all the time. Well, I, I was just reading one of those Lee Child, Jack Reacher novels, yeah. Um, and they are linear. They just go yeah. straight forward. And he drives forward. I mean, he's the guy with the agenda, and he's setting it all the time. People are getting in the way, and people are problems, and they got to be solved. And he solves them. Mm -hmm. you know, um, but there's a lot of others where there's you know good guys and bad guys and people yes. and things, and, they, and it's it's in some ways it's really interesting to read because it's it's easy to stop anywhere and you go on to the next, and, and it flows along really quickly, and you don't have any transition areas that slow you down. Yeah. Well, sometimes it's nice to go through one story and into this story and to that and that, and then they come together at the end. Um, that can be interesting. Uh, well, there's all different, way, there's all different yeah. ways to go into the forest and find your way around. And some of it depends on the complexity of the story you want to tell and to some degree the ability you have to tell a complex story. I prefer relatively simple ones. You know, one character pushing forward against uh, whatever the obstacles are. Um, but then my stories tend to be 
about characters who don't fit into their environment. So they're always on balls in some way. They're outside the, the bell curve. They don't even own the home. They stay in other people's Yeah, they, they wander around the world looking yeah. after other people's Got houses and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and don't care at all. They're just a guy passing through. Yeah. I also came across this idea somewhere that um, scene should have sort of like a you need to give your readers a rest once in a while or something like oh, you yeah. some heavy action oh, yeah, yeah. and well, then yeah, you yeah. need some contemplation or something. Um, well, yeah, I don't yeah. know what you call that. Rhythm. Like the rhythm. Okay. Or pacing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you don't have like rising action, bang, we're all done. Because I mean, you can do. I mean, uh, I, I suppose there's novels written that way. Um, but it's nice to have some kind of climax and then level off and slow down and then build to another and then level off and so on. It seems that like does give you a, a certain amount. Otherwise, of you can exhaust your reader. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it's frenetic that way. Um, it, it you don't want to have too much slowing down, though. No. And it's got to be part of the story. Right. You don't just stop and describe the scenery unless there's some reason why that scenery is important to the character in the story. It seems to me that I usually see that in books where that's where you develop a relationship between characters. You slow down, maybe they have a conversation, and then you take well, yeah. off again. Yeah, yeah, so you can use them to it, yeah, it, still it push be. the forward. Well, yeah, because it, it, it can be that uh, your hero's problem is A, to solve that physical whatever obstacle that's against him, a character or the environment or whatever, uh, and at the same time to establish a relationship with this person of significance to him, which could be a romantic or it could be, you know, mother, father, whatever. Um, and those two are going on at the same time. And of course, that's your inner and outer conflict. Mm -hmm. And you're going to find a way at the end to make a choice, the character makes a choice that will resolve both of those together. You know, he'll finally uh, be able to bury the ghost of his father by doing X about this other problem. You'll finally get the feel he's the man he ought to have been as he, you know, leaps off the building, taking the bad guy with him. I, um, I find in, in Wilbur Smith he uses, where he writes about Africa a lot, and he's got all this adventure going on, and then there's a time when he'll just have a, a almost a half a chapter, which is just appreciating nature, and there's this, and there's that, and that sort of thing, and it, it kind of, ah, and then, bam, yeah. you know, somebody shows um, up, and off it goes again, but it's, 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 it's amazing what it does. It's just it's, it's beautiful. There are writers that fit into that niche, uh, but my advice is don't try and be Wilbur Smith because he already is. You know, it's like when you read a Harold <laughs> Robbins novel and say, well, I could do that. Well, sure, a lot of people could do that. But he was already doing it, so there wasn't room for you to get in beside him. You know, he had the brand. Anyway, um,